You know, I, I have to dig my actual FCC broadcasting license out of storage. I know I've still got it somewhere. I think we should post it just for verification. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I have a license to podcast. Excellent. Actually, a license to, to operate a radio station. See? And it never expires unless you actually really? get... Um, some kind of sanction, kind of sanction like you're, kind of out. you're no longer allowed mr yeah, potts right. enough with that broadcasting fine but actually for this i don't even need that so here we go here we go we've got a bit of a, a problem uh yeah the, the problem is that either we need to do like a four-hour talk show every single day yeah or we should almost just not do it <laughs> I'm leaning towards a four-hour talk show each day, though. It seems like they definitely have enough to talk about. Yeah, to that. you know. So, anyway, yeah, yeah. anyway, okay. from deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Pottscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorable children and planning the revolution. So we have uh, we have a number of quick topics this week, and we yes. have to try and make them quick because we're always pressed we've for time. just been really, really you know it's almost I, I don't mean this to be a humble brag because people do that oh I'm so busy it means I'm so important right I, like so uh, many people I count wish I was on important me important enough to be busy yeah, yeah <laughs> like we're that. not busy because we're important we're busy because we're cleaning up shit all day <laughs> all day. <laughs> <laughs> and it intervening with screaming children, you know. Yeah, uh, and, no, I was supposed to call people and text people. And I, it's not, yeah, it's not happening for me. I don't know. So we have a very limited uh, piece of time to record, but we're taking it. But we're taking it because if we don't, then we don't get something out this week. Yeah. So, so the walk of the week. Sad but true. No walk of the week this week. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along in reading. Do you have anything you want to discuss that you've been reading other than the PK? Uh... Nothing new. But uh, just I want to reiterate for people, if you look, if you seek out this book, I think there's valuable wisdom in it. But it is, like I said, kind of woo-woo. She's got some fringe ideas. I, I personally, I think that's okay. You can read yeah. things and take what you need from it and leave the rest behind. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm not going to go into detail. But as I skim it, I find, really, she's advocating this? you know, huh. and, and I don't see. There's some ideas that are kind of... That I don't agree with, but uh, the the overall big picture, especially of how she recommends cooking and all that, it's, mm. it seems reasonable to I'm me. I'm there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so anyway, but take what you that's take what you can from it and leave the rest. Mm-hmm. We finally finished reading The Hobbit to the Huzzah! kids. It's like some kind of like, do we get like our like our, our Tolkien? Uh, we get a coin, plaque, a little coin from the Tolkien Society or something. Uh, well, the thing is, I've done this before, right? They yeah, this were is younger. not the first time we've read the Hobbit. With the kids. Yeah, but now the the older, you know, the younger ones don't remember it, and the older ones, you know, don't remember it that well either. So. Yeah. Anyway, so it's it's been interesting to read this book again as an adult. So I've read it, you know, as a child, and then I've read it several times as, as an, an adult. adult, right? So it's actually it's frustrating because it's. Well written, but in a style that isn't really considered to be all that well written anymore. Yes, it's no. That's no longer the favorite style of. Especially writing. not for a children's book. No, it's actually uh, mildly inappropriate by modern standards for a children's book. So a lot of chapters have a lot of telling rather than showing. Yep. Where like he's recounting all this stuff going on, and there's no dialogue. Right, and a fair amount of gore. Uh, sometimes there's gore. Yeah. Right. There are a lot of interesting political and ethical ideas that show up in the conclusion, yeah. but I'm not sure the kids are really, really equipped to interpret those things through history. Through right. history, even with him, with him just sort of explaining them, mm-hmm. you know, without them being like really um, shown rather than told. Although, for my part, I think children are a lot more capable than we give them credit for. Well. Yeah, I know, but even, you should just you should, you should just share ideas with them and let them you let should. Them do it. But even I it. find my my eyes glazing over sometimes when I'm reading this long bit about the history of the politics of Lake Town. You know, you know. <laughs> um, so you also kind of realize. Right, I, I admit that I'm a weirdo. Okay. Well, okay. But you know, I do get stuff out of it, but it's mm-hmm. it's sketched in places where you'd really like to see it painted. You know, more oh, vivid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and speaking of sketching and painting, so. The dwarves who make up, you know, most of the characters doing stuff. Yeah. Bilbo's whole party of, mm-hmm. of people is mostly dwarves. Um, most of them don't even get 
uh, descriptions. Descriptions. And most of them barely get lines. They barely get lines. Um, some yeah. of them have no lines at all. Uh, they're just kind of like, um, uh, well, they're. I think they're archetypes. We could do a we could do a show just on the Hobbit. I, you know? I don't even yeah. think he bothered to make most of them into archetypes. They're sort of defined initially by the color of their hoods, and some of them get like a one line description, like. Owen and Glowen are good at making fires or something like right. that. But then maybe they get one line in a crisis situation. Maybe they mm-hmm. don't. You know, they're just not, there's not that much to them. Maybe the length of their beards is described or something. Right. But again, not much, not much to them. So it's a good book to read. There's a lot that happens. And there's a lot, um, in particular, there's a lot that you can spin out and talk about. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, what does that mean? What does that imply? And all that. And that's fun. And uh, you can sing the verses. You can sing the poetry, right? Right, right. If you're brave. Yeah, I'm not that brave. <laughs> and your kids probably won't judge you for your terrible... Likely not. ...coming up with a melody on the fly. Your children love you. So, uh, yeah, so finally done. Um, and we are considering just plowing right on to Lord, into of, the Lord of the Rings. Because, you know, that's it flows from the story. Yeah, but that's... Maybe a little hard, but I think I think the older ones are ready for it. The question is, can we keep the younger ones from getting so bored that they derail the story time? That's always hard, though. Yeah, that's that's independent of the text. I'm also reading uh, a book that is on loan from a friend of mine called, uh, and, and I've had it actually in my ha- in my uh, possession for. A number weeks, of weeks. weeks. But, was poached by Sam. Uh, yeah, Sam borrowed it and hadn't really given it back and keeps reading at it. Mm-hmm. It's called The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President. See, for my part, that just feels like gossip. By Bandy X. Lee et al. So I am a little torn about this book. I've only read the introduction. There's several introductions and prefaces and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And the first chapter. And I'm still sort of um, turning over in my head whether I'm comfortable or not with this idea of psychiatrists and uh, and folks like that who are legally sort of enjoined by something called the Goldwater Rule mm-hmm. to not uh, try to release something that seems like a diagnosis of a public figure. Yeah. Right. Because that uh, violates their professional ethics. Right. But right. yet, yeah, they claim that even though they <laughs> yeah. can't diagnose him, they do have a professional um, uh, thing called a um, duty to warn, like a duty of care, you know? And they say that though they can't diagnose his exact nature of his disorder, they can make note of characteristics to them that seem blatantly dangerous and have a duty to warn the public about that. Okay, that's an open letter. What do you mean? That's not a book that went for sale. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. an open letter. Yeah, yeah. If that's what they're doing, that's an open letter. Well, it is kind of a book of open letters. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. This, I, there, there's everything in the world wrong with the 45, right? Yeah, yeah. But for my part, this is gossip. It. This is self-serving. Uh, well, and, I'm, I'm trying And to... this is part of the pile of of logs we build up against the mentally ill. Yeah, well, there's something to that. But, so, yeah, so I'm, um, I'm kind of... I'm, I'm, I'm reading it, I'm, trying to, I'm trying time. to take out of it what I can get. Like, I'm learning mm-hmm. a bit. So, like, the first chapter talks about, uh, the author argues that, that Trump is an extreme example of uh, what they call present hedonism. Mm. And this comes from something called time perspective theory, which basically says people can be uh, you can sort of break people down uh, according to sort of how they think of themselves versus time, past, present, and future. Okay. Whether they have an extreme bias for the present, the past, or the future, whether it's uh, it's optimistic or pessimistic. And mm-hmm. that's interesting. I've never read those papers that sort of define that you know bit of theory. And so I'm yeah. learning something about that because that whole, like the... Uh, um, the uh, time perspective theory didn't even come into existence until long after I took the last psychology the class, class I've ever taken. Right. right? So, well, you, you know. So anyway, it talks about Trump as as an example of someone with an extremely 
strong bias towards hedonism in the present, Mm -hmm. even when he's, and you see this, of course, when he's contradicting what he said yesterday and will say tomorrow. Tomorrow. Right. Because what matters to him is that second piece of chocolate cake, you know, is is the decision in the moment. Now. And, you know, or scoring points, you know. Yeah. But here's so, the thing. But that's obvious. It's right? obvious, and I don't think we need to pathologize this or give it the veneer of of mental illness as a as an excuse. Yeah. I don't think we need to vilify mentally ill people. I mean, he's, the, he's not ill. He's an asshole. <laughs> that's. Uh, I mean, come on. He's a you know he's a successful business person, which I'm not sure. I think you're being redundant here. <laughs> I, I don't think you have to be, but I think you commonly are. You know yeah, that, yeah. especially when you mix in a media figure, sure. then you're almost guaranteed to be talking sure. about a, psych- a psychopath, right? Yeah. See, I don't. Yeah. All right. But I don't know. So I'm trying to take what I, what of interest I can get from the book. But uh, you know, if it's more of the chapters are just people basically diagnosing him without diagnosing him, him as a sociopath or whatnot, it's not that interesting because. It also it doesn't really suggest to us what we should be doing, doing about that. Right. That's, I mean, that's the thing. That's what's unethical about this. And if this was the duty to warn kind of thing, right? It'd be an open letter, free to the public. You don't have to buy it. Yeah. yeah. And you'd have well, they, some. There was an open conference. They ran a conference, and this book is basically the minutes. From, well, let me. Finish. Sorry. This book is basically <clears throat> the minutes from the conference, right? So All right, and and, well, and and they'd have some kind of action plan prescription some kind of prescription yeah. because yeah. apparently they're you know people that do prescriptions right well that's the thing if someone in the context of their profession if right. they do perceive someone as a severe danger to themselves or others psychiatrists actually have power to for an involuntary commitment period you know right hey, let's do it you know if that's where but, they, want to go but they don't it. have that power in this context and so like all their levers are gone and they're just like waving their arms and yelling like okay great i can do that too yeah so it seems like that seems to be a, a, the entirety of our political discourse <laughs> yeah well there's that so uh, anyway i'm trying to figure out is can i get anything interesting from the book and i already learned something interesting about it about this this um I, you know i have to look at at the words again uh mm-hmm. present hedonism and time perspective theory because there's there are instruments actually you can find i think online and and uh study yourself right, oh, right. answer questions and determine how you fit into this you know what's your bias and most people have a bias in terms oh, yeah. of their their time perspective everyone's biased so yeah anyway and it it also that it that ties into a whole bunch of other theory about various pathologies um towards like present like present damage to the environment versus future Mm -hmm. or and it it has there's a lot of economics built around that theory too is like present expenses versus future you know Mm -hmm. spending and whatnot uh sunk cost fallacy would be one thing that's related to that okay we did a big cooking project oh that was so fun Uh, like the stress even including the stress it was fun it always so i love to do this i wish there was a way that i could do it and not feel so stressed out just under pressure and one of those ways would be to get the kids actually out of the house for the cooking day (laughs) maybe a couple of the older ones could stay and help but something but to get the screamers and interrupters and the ones who are going to demand that we're going to fight that we feed them something else right in the middle of cooking right you know that would be and, and do, that to be would clear, go a long way. something other than the food we've already prepared and offered them right right <laughs> right i like, here's some food food you claim to enjoy yeah i'm not eating that make me yeah, something else right <laughs> even though we're already cooking a third thing i'm cooking a third yeah, thing yeah it's so it's so crazy right. it gets so crazy and we were so pressed for time yesterday so you went out and you were going to run an errand and you were going to be gone for an hour and then when Took you got back hours, yeah. yeah when you got back i was going to have like my sous chef back you know you were going to be prepping your i was doing one main dish you were going to prep some other dishes and all that and we but you were an hour and a half later getting back and so i'm stressing out because i cannot okay so the book we work from is classic indian cooking by julie sani right 
And the thing about classical Indian cooking is it's freaking delicious. It's amazing, amazing. food technology that's been developed over thousands of years. Technology right? is the word. Appropriate yeah. technology, yeah. to be clear. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, but the recipes are designed for a culture of people who have time on their hands, you know, right. who have a day to make this food right. and do it together as a communal as activity. A and right. it's, it's fairly simple. It's actually, not, it's simple the, but not easy. None of the things we've made from this cookbook require anything uh, resembling like a really delicate technique. No, no, no. Right? Yeah, nothing. It's a lot of labor. But there's no like, oh, you have to sear this for exactly seven seconds, and if it's too late, you ruin it ruin or something it. like that. Yeah, no, no. no these actually, recipes have a lot of leeway to right. mess with them. And actually, you may have seen these videos going around. I see them in my Montessori circles all the time. Yeah. Of uh, like three year olds. Yes. Three, four, five year old children making a huge meal. Yeah. By themselves. <laughs> like they've got uh, like the part that. It, the they don't show the child are acting as a consultant. Uh, uh, clearly, there's an adult consulting because uh, I don't see where they was measured out. Like everything's been measured out when they get there. So yeah, they, they, they are, have a sous chef. So they've got someone who's measured everything out, and this little girl or little boy sometimes is like lighting a fire on mm -hmm. a rocket stove, mm -hmm. and then assembling all these ingredients, ingredients that have been laid out, yeah. and then just tending and stirring and tending and stirring, and then making rice, yeah. and serving it. So. I don't see the three-year-old doing any measuring. Yeah, right, right. But I do see uh, the three-year-old <laughs> taking pre-measured ingredients and preparing the whole meal. Yeah. Um, which, even managing the stove and the fire, and it's all set at their level so they can do it. That That's really something that's true. Yeah, sure. Our four-year-old yeah. could manage a lot of this with... A, with a little supervision. A little supervision. Yeah. It, you no, know, I mean, to, you should you teach to. your kids not, you know, how to use a knife early. Yeah, you really should. You know, um, what's worse could happen? <laughs> I mean, really, you know? <laughs> no. But we had, uh, we made a meat curry, gosht curry. I'm sure I'm not quite pronouncing that right. Uh, mm -hmm. Whole eggs and spicy tomato sauce, on the key curry, mm -hmm. and buttered smothered cabbage, band gobi ki zabsi. And we made a big, uh, large quantity of, of uh, roasted garam masala, which means spice, mixed up the spices. spices. Yeah. yeah. And we and we made garam masala from scratch to season the egg and tomato. Yeah. So And yeah, now we have garam masala. Oh, yeah, fresh garam masala. So you start with, uh, when I started cooking in the morning, um, I started with seven cups of, of chopped onions. We got, actually, we, we cheated. We didn't break down all the onions we had bags of of pre-chopped onions bags from pre gfs on yes uh, gfs is not my best friend <laughs> but you know if you got seven cups of chopped onions is a lot it's a lot of chopped and onions and then you want to do something with them called brown frying where you fry them not until they're just golden but until no. they're deep deep brown deep like mahogany, mahogany brown, brown. Yeah. and their volume decreases dramatically right and this takes about 40 minutes. Yep. 45 minutes. Don't let anyone lie to you. Julie Sani lies to you. She tells you just 20, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. No, no, no. Brown frying takes 40 it's minutes. It's 40 minutes. There, There is a trick. You can, if you've got a big cast iron um, crock or something, you can do it in the oven. You can do it in the oven. You can do it in the slow cooker. You have to get the temperature just right. Um, and it is similar to, but not actually the same as, uh, caramelizing yeah. onions. Yeah. Yeah. It's but more than, it's beyond caramelizing. It's beyond caramelizing. Because you can do caramelizing it in... In 35 to 40 minutes. Yeah. Even 30 minutes, maybe. Um, but this takes 40 to 45 minutes. You want to brown, them to really to brown fry them. reduce in volume. So then, you know, I, while that was going on, I was chopping up like, I don't know, 40 cloves of garlic or something like that. And, yes. And a, a piece of ginger literally as big literally as my as big hand. As, yeah. Big, bigger yeah. than an adult man's hand. Yeah. And then, uh, so the garam masala, uh, we got. I went out to the Indian grocery Saturday morning and I got uh, green cardamom pods, black cardamom pods, cinnamon sticks, whole cloves. We had some whole cloves, actually. Um, yeah. We got some fresh black peppercorns and cumin seed and coriander seed. Um, so the time-consuming part of that is picking apart the cardamom pods because you want the seeds from the fresh-ish, you know. Right, cardamom pods. Pods, you have to peel them open or, or cut them open with scissors and pry them apart and then take the so little... So they can actually toast. Yeah, you take the little tiny bits out mm -hmm. and throw away the, the little shells. 
So then you right. roast this in a dry cast iron skillet and mm-hmm. toss it. You have to keep tossing keep it. Tossing. Because you don't want it to burn. You don't actually want it to burn. And the skillet has to be pretty hot. It goes pretty fast, but it goes um, right from just about perfect to burn quickly if you don't watch. Yes. And then we also picked up a big mortar and pestle. Somewhere we had a little one, but I just went ahead and got a much bigger one. one. Mm-hmm. And we gave that to Veronica and said, here. And she sat, she patiently sat there and, and yes. ground up all this roasted spice. Along with Sam. Sam helped too. Yes. So uh, then for the meat curry, you started out by uh, roasting oxtails at uh, 275. 275. For like two, three hours. They sat in the oven for several hours right. in, in the um, cast iron uh, Dutch oven mm-hmm. open. Uh, and then, um, so a lot of the fat just rendered right out of them, and was there's a layer of, of clear fat in the mm-hmm. bottom of the pan. And then the oxtails were nice and kind of roasted looking. Yeah. Um, and then we used for the meat, we used a few pounds of bison steaks. Yeah. So but yeah, two two one and a half pound steaks. So it was like yeah, three, three pounds. Of meat. So bison is really lean, so the extra fat is very helpful. And then mm-hmm. when we cooked the whole thing together, we threw the oxtails in the sauce. In the sauce and the curry just and they cook cooked it. for about ninety minutes or so. Mm-hmm. Um. And that allowed the oxtails to release a lot of gelatin into yeah. the sauce, which makes it really, really it. smooth. And then when it was all done, did you pick the meat off the uh, Yeah, I did. I, tri- I trimmed the oxtails, but I saved the bones, though. Yeah, you take the bones out because you don't want to serve it with bones in. Right. Um, so it's supposed to simmer for two hours and then cook for another half hour with the potatoes in. And then rest for two hours and then get reheated with the fresh coriander thrown in. Yeah. Uh, We did not have that much time. So we had Mm -hmm. to cut the two hours down to like an hour and a quarter for each stage or something like that. But it was still Mm -hmm. very good. Right. Yeah. Oh, it was was more than, it was really fantastic. Yeah. So. And then the same ingredients, mostly the same ingredients, went into the sauce for the eggs. A lot of the same ingredients, but you know what? It didn't taste the same. It doesn't taste the same. Right. No, I, I'm, I'm not clear. I can't fully explain to you your finger on it, what's how different. similar ingredients produce well, it, different flavors. But, you're not, but it did. It doesn't have all the, any meat in it, right? So that's well, it's meatless, yeah. and it also has garam masala. Yeah. But yeah that, the garam masala is a little like sweeter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like the cloves and the, and, uh, the cinnamon. cinnamon sticks make, yeah. it, make it more well, of a... The, and that's... That's actually true. I think those two things are enough. Yeah. But like they both start with the same flavor base of ginger, garlic, and onion. Yeah. Ginger, garlic, garlic and caramel or uh, brown fried onions. So then we also fried a couple platters of papadums. We had some sauce that was pre-made. We didn't make, we didn't make uh, sauce. chutneys. And, and we opened up the last few bottles of wine, which went back to Christmas and Thanksgiving. Yeah, that was a good that was a nice touch. We had uh, two of them I want to mention, a 2015 Arcturus Late Harvest Riesling from oh, Black Star Farms. That's a great Riesling. Michigan wine. Yeah. It's one it's, of the best sweet wines I've ever had. Yeah, it's a little sweet. If you don't like sweet, you probably won't like it, but it's if you don't mind sweet and yeah. you like Riesling, it's really quite good. I I mostly like much drier wines, mm-hmm. but these Sweeter wines go really well with Indian food because it's not sweet. And if you have are trying to eat something like this curry with like a dry red, it just they really clash in your mouth. Right. They don't they don't complement each other. Yeah, the yeah. sweet the sweet wines really go well with spicy Indian food. Um, mm-hmm. The other one we had was Chateau Fontaine cherry wine. Oh yes, we had some cherry wine, and that sounds uh-huh. like it must be so awful, like cough syrup. No, it's, it's actually pretty damn good. Yeah. It's is made in Michigan. It's from the um, Leelanau Peninsula area, mm-hmm. and it's really good. Right. surprisingly good because you know like I, I got served this a few years ago at, at our friend's house mm-hmm. and I was they said no no I know it looks horrible, it looks horrible. taste it taste and it. I'm like oh come on this is going to be kind of some kind of menace of its nightmare <laughs> uh, like you know like eating toothpaste hey. and, and I drank it. I'm like, oh, this is actually really <laughs> <We're> good. good. <laughs> hey, you know, Manischewitz makes some decent wine that they don't sell at the supermarket, okay? Yeah, they do. <laughs> okay, so our friend came over, our friend Scott. Uh, he brought apple and cherry pies and ice cream, and we finished up with 
with uh, cherry pie, and which is not really Indian in flavor, but you know it's well, it, fruit, right? It was fruit. So yeah, it was a good. It was fruit a good goes fish. well with Indian food. Mm-hmm. So anyway, there's lots of leftovers. I'm gonna have wonderful meat curry for lunch for, for lunch, a couple days. days, and it gets better as it sits. It really does. That's why the the it, the recipe, recipe tells yeah. you let it rest, make it the day before, <sighs> right. reheat it. it yeah. 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 So it really does get better. And I'm not entirely clear whether I can explain why it gets better. It has something to do with the meat fibers continuing to break down, like with the the spices like that are soluble in oil, maybe migrating more into the sauce. I think that they're I just don't know. Well let's not have a chemistry breakdown. How about that? Let's Let's not have a chemistry breakdown. Anyway, it it gets better as it sits. Mm-hmm. At least one night overnight, and probably even two. Yes. So. Well, and a lot of her dishes, she recommends you know just stick this in the freezer and pull it out when you have a party. You know, yeah, like yeah. this freezes really well. It and actually just, improves. Right. Make it the night before, serve it. So one day we'll learn that lesson. But we keep when we do these ambitious yet. cooking things, and we love Indian food. Right. But we always sort of are slightly more ambitious than we can pull off without stressing ourselves out. So. Right. Anyway. We're going to time the rest of the show in chunks. In chunks, because we're doing lightning rounds. We're going to try lightning rounds. So I'm going to try and talk fast, and we're going to get through several topics um, as best we can. So we went through, what, where, where, where are we now? Is, um, as far as time. The time is 5.08. 508. Yep. Okay, so we have enough time for four lightning rounds, and four? then we race to get in the car. Yep. Okay. It's going to be great. And then go to mass. Making and, the podcast and great again. i got to put clothes on that I'm not ashamed, ashamed to, leave the house. to leave the house in. I can't leave the house like this. Look at me. All right. So the first topic, I watched the video from the Uber self-driving oh, car yeah. crash. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And uh, I had some thoughts, and I tried to get a dialogue going on Twitter, but Twitter is not actually good at all for getting dialogue going. No, you make it one or two likes or shares or comments. Twitter is really increasingly totalitarian, as I say. <laughs> but go, go on. It's just it. It never seems to work for me. There are people who have similar numbers of followers th- who get traction. Who get traction and wind up having a lot of interaction and retweets and shares Doesn't and whatnot. Doesn't seem weird to you. I I think I may be shadow banned. Like in a in a secret doghouse that I don't know about. Oh yeah, yeah. Where I don't show up on people's feeds because I'm tagged as too spicy, too spicy. I don't know, but so I haven't figured it out. Anyway, I watched the video so you don't have to because it's a little disturbing to watch. Yeah, they edited the the um uh actual video from the dash cam. So you don't have to watch the woman die, right? Yeah, it, um, which is... It cuts off just before the car hits her. But mm-hmm. um, watching it, I kept thinking, uh, wow, I would have hit her. Oh, okay, yeah. And I, I've not seen it, just to clear. clear yeah, that. well, what you're seeing is you're seeing a dash cam video of this car driving along on what looks like a service drive or an off-ramp. Right. Um. And it's very dark. There are street lights, but the street lights are widely separated. Mm-hmm. And it's just going along this like one line, one lane service drive. That's what it looks like. Right. And then suddenly, just sort of out of the edge of this dark area, there's this woman walking her bike across the road. Mm-hmm. And uh, because of the lighting, uh, you can't see anything of this woman until about two and a half seconds before, before it hits before her. the car hits her. Right. Maybe three seconds. It's hard to judge on mm-hmm. the video. But all you can see initially in the very first frames, if you sort of slow it down and go frame by frame, is like she's got some reflective spots on her shoes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't see anything else because it looks to me like she does not have any reflectors on her bike she doesn't have any reflective patches on her clothes or anything she doesn't have any lights on her Mm -hmm. bike or herself and when i used to commute by bike after dark 
I had reflectors, and then I actually I had a headlamp, and then I actually stuck a flashing LED on my backpack. Oh yeah, so you know, you, so you could that, be seen, so that I could be seen. Mm-hmm. I think I probably had uh, a flasher on the back of the bike and one on my back, mm-hmm. um, although it was off to one side, so it wouldn't necessarily be seen from the other side. Right, right. But the idea is, you really, mm-hmm. if you're a commuter mm-hmm. on a bike. You really should be wearing, you can get these cheap uh, strap-on reflective vests that go over your clothes. You can get these um, LED flashers that clip to your bike or clip to your clothes or your bag. Mm -hmm. You should have as many of those as you can deal with. Yeah. Ideally. Ideally. And if you're you're commuting Mm -hmm. in a city on a bike and you're sort of plugged into the bike commuting culture is that guys you do these things you learn these things sure sure right Right. so just to say and but looking at this had had i been coming upon this woman in the dark i probably would have hit her too and there have been many times driving home after dark right where i will come across pedestrians walking in the street pedestrians and cyclists both yeah or with you know wearing sweatpants black sweatpants or something and nothing Mm -hmm. reflective at all or not even light. Right. Right. And we'll barely see them. Right. And it's very hard for people to realize in, that, that in certain invisible. lighting conditions, unless they're actually lit from behind, if they're not either putting out light themselves or lit from behind, they are invisible until they get close enough to your headlights that you can really illuminate them. Right. And that may be too late to avoid hitting them. Yeah. So there's that. Um, now I've never hit anyone, and I, I think Hope of myself as a pretty cautious driver. And I'm mm-hmm. really not trying to blame this woman. I right, think, well, no, because it, it, there's a way in which I, I've been holding my response. Is that should I be holding it still or no? Go okay, ahead. yeah, no. I, I think there's a way in which that framing is kind of victim blaming. Right. I, mean, I know where she does, where she can't afford the flashes, where she's not plugged yeah. into that community. And frankly, there's another. There's, there's a huge community. It dwarfs the sort of um, urban commuter, bike commuter community of right. people who are just poor and have no other way to get around. Right, right. Um, and so, I mean, you, uh, yeah, I, I, in my little tweet storm, I said, you know, one thing, we really have to ask yourself, why was this woman trying to cross eight lanes of traffic. freeway traffic on a bike? Right. Right. What, structurally, structurally, like how did how did how it come, come to, to this? And right. that's that's a bigger question that's that really we question. should be asking. That's more important than saying, oh well, what well she, should she have done really to... should have had reflectors on. Right. But one thing also that As I if would that's the whole ad- answer. Right. right. But one thing I would advocate for is if someone has to be out after dark biking, every bike shop should should have a program where they give you these vests and reflectors and whatnot for for free. For free, I here mean, just for safety reasons. Yeah. But I, that's that's a. Excellent suggestion, um, but th- this uh, larger group of uh, people, like I've often said, I have never driven through Saginaw not once, yeah, and not seen someone commuting on a bike, right? Not once ever, right? In any kind of weather, so three hundred sixty-five days a year. Yeah, again, I can't. You can't guarantee that, like either the the um, the human supervisor would have seen her had she had reflective Which gear light, or flashers or, or lights or the car. I don't know if what the it, car is doing. If it would have detected her with those with things on, maybe, but it, maybe not. But I mean, maybe it, it likely would not have harmed her to have those things. Right. But the oh, and there's another layer here because of the class difference between the folks, this larger group of uh, bike commuters and pedestrians. Yeah. Um. There's sort of like an anti cachet about not doing all that, you know, loser stuff like getting a helmet. You know, like, what do I need a oh, helmet for? There, you know what I mean? There's there like is a, that. right? And so you, I, I don't think we need to make it about this sort of class difference. I don't think you need to make it about right. what you're doing as a pedestrian. Free helmets would help too. It would go a long know. way, right? But I think it needs to be much more about um, our structural design and. Like, who the hell is the street for, anyway? Right. Who is this for? Right. Why did we build well, this street? Well, the thing is, even g- given where she was crossing, 
Right. Uh, I believe, and I, I don't have a complete map of where sure, she was, sure. I don't know. but I believe that that would have been a, an insanely dangerous place to cross for any person. For any person. And, and under any circumstances. And it certainly wasn't legal. Right. A legal crossing. Right? You know, it certainly wasn't. Well, a, not that, Again, I'm not saying, well, she broke the law, she therefore the she law. deserved to die. That's not what I'm saying. Right. No, no, I'm no. saying, why are people forced to do all these incredibly risky things because their alternative is is going 20 miles out of their way? Right, right. You know? No, was it checked at a great piece of... Uh, well, I, actually, an intersection I personally know well. Yeah. Um, the Springfield Public Library in Springfield, Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. It's so there's the door to the um, library is across the street from the parking lot, and there's like an opening in the parking lot that matches up with the door, right? Yeah. But it's now it's like a five lane strode. Right in front of the door. Right in front of the door, and so. The legal Crazy crossing dangerous. is two blocks in either direction. Yeah. Yet the parking lot to, for the library and the library are maybe 20 yards from each other. Yeah. And any rational person would leave the opening of the parking lot and walk to the opening of the library. Right. The legal crossing, though, is two blocks away in either direction. So there, and anyone just doing the obvious thing is breaking the law. Is breaking the law. And... And women putting in, themselves at, at serious risk. risk. And specifically, there was an incident. A woman and her child in a stroller was struck and both killed crossing this ridiculous yeah. pathway to get to the yeah. library. to go to the library. Right. This is, this is how dumb we are when we design these things. Because we're making, we're creating this for the cars. Right. We're not creating for the people that use the cars, but for the cars themselves. Right. So I wrote, um, I know I was trying to be provocative to get a response to yeah, uh, I'm not sure what this means, except it might mean driverless cars have to be far slower than human drivers. Mm. And it might mean that ultimately they just can't use the same roadways because human behavior is too unpredictable and dangerous for humans to be trusted around robots. Mm-hmm. And I, I believe that. I mean, if, we're, if we don't want to be killed by robots, we can't allow people to, inter- to interact randomly around robots. Because humans are random. We do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, some people are blaming the supervising driver. So there was a person in the yeah. car, and part of the dash cam video actually is mm-hmm. watching the person in the car. The mm-hmm. person in the car had her eyes down mm-hmm. at the moment when she could have maybe maybe corrected the maybe car. corrected the car, maybe braked. Mm-hmm. Now, but I still believe that the person was visible only, you know, so close. Right, that the physics of the situation dictated that the car probably could not have avoided hitting her. You know, I don't know Maybe for hundred so. percent sure mm-hmm. exactly how fast it was going and all that. But you do the math, and you're like, oh, the car could not stop. Stopped. Yeah, could right. stop at that at the time that the driver or the robot right. saw right the pedestrian. They could the car couldn't stop it's, anymore. It's not appropriate to blame the human attendant of the robot for the robot's action <laughs> because the human. Well, first of all, even to talk about a robot's actions or a robot's or blaming a robot is crazy, right? Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. That's like saying, "Oh, well, you know, I I put the wind up Killbot two thousand in the in the gar- in the grocery store, but I'm not responsible for all the people it mowed down." That's <laughs> right. the robot did that. The robot that doesn't make any damn sense, right? right? right. So, uh, what we have is with these supervising drivers is a situation where. We've put someone into the most boring driving scenario imaginable, imaginable. which driving, is but not even driving. They're not even supposed to do anything unless they need to intervene because they're testing this thing, right? And they want to see if it always does the right thing itself. So mm-hmm. you're supposed to be alert the whole time. You're doing nothing. You have no agency. You're just being dragged around by this car. Like I can't imagine not being bored out of my skull and losing my focus in this situation. So, but in, now what we have is this poor, this poor supervising slug. driver has been traumatized and maybe given PTSD for God's sake, you yeah. know, by having to watch this car kill someone yes. and not actually having an opportunity to react fast enough to do anything. Do anything about do anything and, and now is also being, you know, Vilified smeared, right. right? 
So uh, humans don't have to actually make decisions and watch for threats. We have a tendency to go into this ener energy-saving mode ourselves and mm, zone out, right? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. So I come down to like, in a very real sense, I don't think humans can actually be trusted to supervise autonomous cars. That's not cynicism. It's just realism. I don't think also if we really are upset by the idea of robots killing people, we have to keep people out of their pens, mm -hmm. right? Which may... You know, if we're really not going to accept the risk, right. however low, that robots will kill people, and they'll kill people at lower you know, rates than right. humans do, but that they will, mm -hmm. you know, and we're not willing to adjust the systems, mm -hmm. right? We can't have this thing. No. Because the solution to avoiding this is put the robots on their own roads. Don't we have that? Right. I think we have that. That's called a train. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and so we have. Those you know, have been some great robots too. <laughs> well, you know, so I'm not opposed to self-driving trains on a track, right? Right. No, that could be great. Could be a thing. So I think we may have them to some extent. Uh, yes. So, but making these individual cars intermixed with both people and human drivers on mm -hmm. on mixed roads of all types, freeways all types. of all different access types. It doesn't quite make any sense. So I mean, no, because I mean, there's going to be there's yeah. going to be a death toll. We have light rail for this kind of thing where people don't want to think about driving, mm -hmm. and we have something called taxi cabs. Yeah, for getting people in and out of their neighborhoods, right, from their homes to their to their light rail or wherever it is they're going to go. So whatever it is they're doing, I'm just not convinced that trying to mix all these things up is ever going to be really viable or even make sense. Or even make sense. Right. So, anyway, we'd like to, to hear what you think about yeah, well, that. Well, I think that, you know, I, I, I think you know what I think, Paul, but... I, well, what you should say it, you know. I, I, I think that autonomous Agriculture cars, was a bad idea. <laughs> agriculture was a bad idea. The enlightenment needed to not happen. But no, what I think specifically about this is that um, this is a solution looking for a problem. Yeah, this is a yeah. way that people with money can make more money off of us and our needs, yeah. and constrict our ability to do what we want to do, which might be I don't know, walk around in the woods picking our noses. Yeah, you know, so I'm 50 now. I have some health problems already. My eyes aren't so great anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the end of my own ability to like drive myself wherever and whenever I want to go places. Yeah, not tomorrow, but but you know, you know in a foreseeable future. Right. right. And so, you know, you kind of might put your hopes on some future where you can summon an autonomous car and just get in and tell it where you want to go. And then it yeah. doesn't have to rely on your eyes and your, you know, reflexes and all these things. Something. And that seems great in a way, but I don't want to achieve that for myself mm -hmm. at the risk of everyone else, all other drivers and pedestrians and cyclists and whatnot in this system, in this right. mixed up system. Well, and the way that humans have traditionally solved this problem of not being able to go out on the hunt anymore yeah. is that you stay in the village and you walk around and you do things in the village. Yeah. Instead uh, of going out on the hunt. But instead we're going to be asking older and older people to continue working. Driving, getting someplace to, to earn, a driving, earn a paycheck. To do whatever they can to work. Yeah. Yeah, good job. I don't know, maybe they can all do sex work, because that's cool now. <laughs> hey, they, you know, they may lack the uh, the taut skin and perky boobs or whatnot, but they they, <laughs> they really make, make it up an experience. experience. <laughs> Anyway, okay. I think we're going to move on to our next topic. Yeah, we got we got like eight seconds left on this one. Eight seconds. We we did it. We, we did, did it. it. Fifteen Boom. minutes. Okay. I'm impressed with us. I'm impressed too. Let's keep talking. Yeah. What's the next so, one? So next one. There we go. Yeah. This is our friend Caitlin. Oh, I, yeah. I love Caitlin so much. Caitlin Johnstone, who <laughs> is, is always freak. getting herself in trouble <laughs> online. Oh, freak! I love it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Caitlin. Uh, call into a show sometime. We'll we'll arrange it. You know. Yeah, we love to talk to you, Caitlin. She's like twelve hours time. She's in Australia. She's yeah. in Australia. So, so it's going to be kind of interesting. We'll for have to one get up us. at four o'clock in, in the morning, morning to talk or something. To well, we could probably do like a nine a.m. nine p.m. thing. Maybe that might work. Uh, I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know how many. How, is it really twelve hours? I, I don't it's, actually know, but it's very different. It's very different. Um, she has a piece 
Uh, she talks about something that's ripped from today's headlines. Dun, dun. Why I disagree with the strategy of exiting Facebook, Twitter, Twitter and, and YouTube. YouTube. And mm. this is kind of a, a bit of a long rambling essay, but I'm going to... All of her essays are a little bit long and rambling. They just, are a little we, bit. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like her show, but go on. She's trying to produce an enormous amount of content, kind of like we are, and she doesn't have, probably like us, the time to edit things down into really pithy, you know, pithy... Pithy, tight... Sound bites. Sound bites. But yeah, she's got a thing, and she's and she's got people... Uh, get, hooking up her Patreon, that's good. And she makes that. good points. She really does. So this is something, you know, everyone is saying, just delete Facebook, just get delete off Facebook. Facebook. Just get off. And oh, it's awful. As a leftist who uses Facebook for leftist organizing... <laughs> I'm feeling a little I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm feeling a little I don't know about that. It really is... Um, and it's not just that. I mean, you should yeah. mention... Josh's uh Oh yeah, like so Josh was in a in a choir. Ten fifteen seconds of fame. And the choir did a profile. They do profiles of all the choristers. Yeah. And they did his profile with his little picture and interview. Little interview. And it it was so <laughs> precious. Oh my goodness. I, I just right. so yeah, and, it was really sweet. And his great little picture. And that's now part of YouTube part of Facebook. Right. It's like part of the thing, the behemoth that is Facebook. Right. And if we wanted to see to see that We'd have to be on there. You'd be on there to you know. see that. Right. And it's the same like all these groups that we're part of or people we want to affiliate with or, or connect with as an audience or interact with. Right. So many of those interactions come through Facebook. It's easy to say, well, just delete Facebook. The, Facebook is, is a... Facebook has replaced a lot of normal, healthy human relationships with yes. Folgers Instant. Right. Well, and just replaced like this... Uh, the commons yeah it's become a utility that's what people aren't saying aren't saying. it's becoming utility and because it's become a utility and a public good it needs to be nationalized <laughs> yeah says the statist yeah that's that's what people aren't saying about it right. that, that it's too important now to be left in the hands of of a private corporation or even yeah. a publicly traded corporation right so, right no, it's really... but that's not that's that's me that's not that's uh, not caitlin. caitlin talking so caitlin is she quotes a guy. She's talking about um, how these these um, this ties in. It's kind of hard to summarize this article because it is a bit rambling. Mm -hmm. But this ties in with what's happening on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, which is that these organizations are actually purging um, non-centrist voices. They're, they're pur the guys is so the frame is oh those Nazis and fake news and the fake news the Nazis and the fake news we have to get rid of all of them the Nazis and the fake news right it's so terrible it's destroying our <clears throat> democracy we have to do something oh my god censorship that's the answer so Facebook has has hired something like 14,000 people right to filter material bless their hearts right and Plan to hire they're, more. They're, they're planning to hire more. Jobs. They, you, have you seen this, this economy? Up. We need these jobs. Yeah, we need these jobs, right? So, um, so this is so, and they're bragging about how their time spent on Facebook has actually been declining, yes. and what they're saying is that people are spending less and less time on Facebook on average. Individuals mm -hmm. spend less and less time on Facebook, and the reason for this is that they're they're signing on. They're getting the information they need, and they're not distracted by all this fringe all the stuff. Right, all this fringe stuff. Right. Oh, thank goodness. So, um, there, I'm going to quote her. Okay. Questions yeah. made clear. We're looking at two possibilities. First possibility, a Silicon Valley tech plutocrat who censors the speech of political dissidents and hoards tens of billions of dollars while the poor starve honestly cares about encouraging meaningful connections. That's what he, Zuckerberg has said. Right. And being, quote, good for people's well-being and society, so much that he would slash his own profits to make that happen. That's the first possibility. Hmm. Okay. The other is, this isn't about helping people and it isn't about money. This is about marginalizing dissident voices as part of Silicon Valley's extensive and well-documented alliance with the national security state. Yeah. Oh, and okay. So if you're a skeptic, the first question you may ask yourself is, why would they do that? Why would they ally with the national security state? Google's getting paid to develop AIs for drones. Right. The, the national security state pays them. They get yeah. money from the national security state. And they're... Um, uh, 
the regulatory capture puts them in a position where that's viable for them to do so. Yeah. Right? Now yeah. they have the lion's share and they get the money. So continuing on, millionaires, this is Caitlin again, millionaires think in terms of money and profit. Billionaires think in terms of power and dominance. Zuckerberg isn't filtering non-mainstream media off of Facebook for the good of society, and he isn't doing it for the money either. He's doing it because he is an oligarch in the borderless new empire, and it is in the empire's interests that dissident voices be silenced. Yes. So I'm not going to read her whole thing, but um, the few clear-eyed rebels are not going to kill Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter by marginalizing themselves into the fragmented fringe of alternative social media outlets. And she talks about a few like Steemit and Droob and Gab and MeWe. What's MeWe? Someone was complaining about it. I don't. I don't. I haven't even tried to check these things out. The only okay. one I've heard about is uh, Rich has been trying out is called mammoth which is like a distributed open source facebook oh right, right but it has the same problems that sites like google plus did which it, it, no one goes if to it's an empty wasteland you can hang out there that's great but you're not actually you're by achieving your goals right um Skipping down a little bit, I know it's intensely creepy that these Silicon Valley corporations are being used to gather information on us. I know it's incredibly frustrating to watch them strangle our numbers further and further into a marginalization, but the reasons they are fighting so hard to wedge us out of their mainstream platforms is because they want us out. So saying, okay, we'll leave. If you don't want us here, we'll leave, is it's not a punishment, punishment. it's a reward. reward. Yeah, it's a very, I think, very cogent comment. Yes. No, no. The, if, to, if, if you want to punish these people for their errant behavior, um, stay and be a pain in the ass. Stay and be a pain in the ass. Don't. I mean, if you enjoy things and you get something out of Facebook, and I do, one of the things is contact with a lot of my family members who I would not con be in contact stay. with otherwise. Enjoy those things. Engage them. So, uh, yeah, they're not driving me out that easily. Although nope. I'm looking into what I can take away, what I can take off of Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. They make it really hard to do that. Oh, yes. To delete your whole timeline, to purge your whole timeline is incredibly difficult. And right. that's deliberate. You know, mm -hmm. you have to run a script. And I tried to leave it running overnight once to like even delete like one year of posts. And it, it got through about three months and then kind of locked up, you know. <gasps> Sorry. Because you, ha the only way that the Facebook system gives you to like delete posts from your past mm -hmm. is to scroll down. Keep scrolling. I've been on Facebook for more than ten years. Keep scrolling. Right. Wait further. <laughs> thousands and thousands of posts, and you have to select them and delete them individually. individually. Which is how asinine is that? It takes. How asinine it, is that? Yeah, you, you can't actually do it. You know, right? I personally am not terribly interested in that. I mean, if I didn't right. want it, if I didn't want it in the public, I didn't put it out there. You know, I, I, but, my compromise for them owning information about me mm -hmm. would be to autom to have it automatically purge everything that's older than say three years. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I would adjust that horizon a little bit, but yeah. if there was a setting that said. You know, after every post or interaction that's older than three years, just delete it automatically. I would love mm -hmm. that. And, you know, your email client can do that for you. Right. Right? You can set... Yeah, just... You can tell it right. to uh, to delete things that are older than 30 days or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't Facebook be able to delete things that are older than a year or three years or 10 years right. even? Well, because they don't want to. They don't want you to. They don't right. want to. They don't that's want to. a huge archive of stuff that all their affiliates and everyone who licenses their API or pays them to use their API can data mine. Right. 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 So, And, and there's, a, there's another corollary to this idea that, you know, the way to punish them, the way to get back at them, the way to, and I even hate that imagery of getting back or punishing, but the way to challenge their aggression is not to leave. Yes. But to be a pain in the ass. And to force them into force their hand to drag you out, kicking and screaming. To drag me out, and then you can say, "Look, I was, you know, you can at least well, no, try to be an example of their censorship." Yes, if you're an example of their censorship, every person that knows you, yeah, knows what happened. Yeah, they saw what happened, and unless they're very deeply 
deeply embedded in the the national security state. And some people are. Some of these sort of centrist Democrat folks really are and will just say what the state says to say. No, they'll they'll happily throw you under the bus. Happily. They'll totally knock you out, right? Yeah. Um, and some of them will be like, well, if you didn't want that to happen, you shouldn't have like, said what you think. And, and all the time... Because that's not allowed. And all the time they'll be thinking, oh, they were, they were your real friends, you know? Yeah. It's too bad you went off the rails like that. Yeah. No, but, it was so sad, but yeah. yeah, here we were for you, uh, reminding you to say what you're supposed to say or else face punishment. Um <laughs> But for anyone with a conscience, with a, with a not, not just a conscience, but with a formed conscience, and the ability to to interrogate facts, we'll see what happens. Yeah, they'll see yeah. you locked out, banned, or whatever it is. Yeah, that is forced to happen to censor you. Okay, and that's something you can't. You can be a Cassandra about that, or you can go down like that, and that's far more influential for the people who are still there. Right. Right. Or maybe you don't go down because maybe they've just maybe eventually they decide that you know what purging ten percent of Facebook actually looks bad makes them look bad. makes them look bad. So here's right. Caitlin again. Noam Chomsky said that the smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow very lively Vigorous debate, debate within that spectrum. Yes. So we highlighted the exact same part. That's yeah, we did, and that's exactly what the propagandists are engineering with their censorship practice on Facebook, Absolutely. Twitter, and Google. The only thing on the menu in cable news is the extremely biased, or extremely, sorry, I can't even read it because our printer is so bad. An extremely, extremely heated, heated ongoing debate ranging from the corporatist Orwellian warmongering neoliberalism of NSNBC to the corporatist Orwellian ne- warmongering, warmongering neoliberalism of Fox, Fox News. news. They want that debate to be happening on mainstream online discourse as, as well. well. And for those to be the the edges, for that to be right. the Overton window. That's right? the window. And you can't everything from Hannity it. to Maddow. Right. And everything and left or right of that. It's just crazy or talk. Or even at right angles to that. Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. And it's crazy talk. Yeah. It's nothing that we anyone can talk about or have any kind of, you know, anything about. It's just, you know, people being crazy. Um as if, like, you know, that's something to vilify someone for. Okay. Yeah. Good. And, oh, then this one last little bit. I, I just have a, a couple of minutes, and I wanted to say this one thing. So, um, if that's the window, right, and if that's what the conversation is, yeah. and things outside that window are... Verboten. Verboten to all. Um, we had that on the news, we had that on, on cable news. We had that on network news. And the really cool, innovative thing that happened that changed the debate is social media. Yeah, yeah. That's Suddenly, things are getting weird now. Right. So now we've got to reshape social we've media. We've got to reshape social media and so make it look looks more like, like cable mainstream news. news. It looks like yeah, cable news, and it right. looks like... And I'll, actually, and this is really frightening to me, except for my um, real, straight-up freak friends, mm-hmm. my fate looks like cable news. It does now. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, yeah. I start, honestly, I started to self-censor on Facebook, partly just to preserve some of my time to work on things like this instead. Right. Instead of having these arguments on Facebook. But right? in part because I just am, like, fed up with people losing their minds at, over what I think to be relatively straightforward, rational Losing arguments. their minds because you moved outside of the Overton window. Yeah, and it's gotten narrower, definitely, yeah, in the last narrow, few years. narrow, narrow. And so... I used to have much more interesting debates on Facebook. I have a few friends, I want to say maybe 20 <laughs> friends, that live outside that window, mm-hmm. right? But the vast majority, more than a thousand people, are just, like, showing me fa- face, showing me corporate news on Facebook, yeah. yeah. And I don't think that they are being paid and I don't think that they're being coerced. I think they're volunteering to do it. They're basically volunteer Maddow promoters or Hannity promoters. Yeah. Right. And yeah. it's very and and, and they're, the, they're the people who are telling me how duped I am because I about you know about Russia. About Russia. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's 15 minutes. All right. Good. Okay. Next. Next piece. You know, I may try and chop this up and put music bits in. We'll see. I don't well, know. my timer is so musical. It's really great. <laughs> it's just Slate. a cool thing. What's, what's happening in Slate? Well, 
Slate is people like, oh, I can't trust this as a source because this is from Slate. You can't trust anything as a source. No, Go but they, they, for, Slate is a is an aggregator. Like right. they they take, uh, you know, they they have a gaping maw to fill. Right, but no, seriously, you can't trust any source. Yeah, learn how to read in particular. Right. So you know, you got to look at each author and each source. Right. You know, like and, even and us, treat it. You know. treat it on its own merits. So Slate has a lot of different writers they host. You know, mm-hmm. this is Margaret Hennessy. Margaret Hennessy. Talking about suburban housing costs stretching families to the brink. I, I wouldn't know about that. Yeah. So this is uh, part of a series called Suburban Slide from something called the Better Life Lab. Huh. And it probably didn't originate with for as a piece for Slate. Mm-hmm. And we're probably walking in sort of in the middle of a series, a conversation of some kind. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, they're talking about the changing face of poverty. Yeah. yeah. So I had a hard time picking out like uh, some pithy little phrases to highlight in this article. But I think, uh, if not with this article per se, this is something we have to be talking about. Yeah. And also as part of our focus on millennial economics. Right. Like, how is this supposed to add up? How is this supposed to add up for young people? It doesn't even add up for older people. No, it doesn't. So there's an example, uh, Carrie Marino. um, And they just sort of jump right in and start talking about Carrie Marino, a single mom with three kids who needs a job and needs a place to live. And her... uh, issues with trying to as covered in this article with trying to find a place to rent is one of them is that you know she needs to have three times the rent yes right first and last month's rent and she has to earn three times the rent each month right yeah and she's supposed to earn in order not to be cost burdened you ought to be earning three times your housing costs at least one of the big focuses of this article is how just for for just how many people and for an ever increasing number of people mm-hmm. that equation doesn't work anymore right um so I'll skim a few points here uh she looked at a lot of places uh at first she didn't qualify because she hadn't lined up her job but because she didn't have three times the rent rent, rent yeah. plus first and last months at the lease uh, most places were charging at least a thousand dollars at the time. She right. said, "So she lived in an RV for a while." Said the property managers would apologize and tell her she'd been rejected. They could do that because demand was so much higher mm-hmm. than supply. This is another sort of focus of this article: is that in these neighborhoods where people are finding work, housing stock has not kept up. Rental housing has no, not no. kept up at all with another with a number of people who need to rent there in order to live, in order to work there. And, yeah, there's no way they can work there unless you're going to have autonomous cars drive them in. I swear. <laughs> the 1950s stereotypes surrounding place-based urban poverty are still deeply embedded in American policy and culture, preventing families from accessing affordable, safe housing, key to their work-life stability and well-being. This is quoting, of course. American yeah, yeah. suburbs were not designed to accommodate affordable housing units, or the influx of renters who are now the norm, nor were federal housing policies designed to confront the suburbanization of poverty. Right. So this isn't change. Yeah, yeah. Poverty used to be, by design, confined to urban, you know, to cities. Right. There was actually a, a planned and wanted uh Concentrate. <laughs> concentration of poverty. Essentially a concentration camp, if you will, for poor people. For poor people. Um, who were forced into these increasingly, you know... Racialized ghettos. Racialized ghettos, right? Yeah. It's changed. It, the things have shifted. The poverty's moved outward, and we have no infrastructure plan to meet it. And, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure which is worse, concentration camps for the poor or just, you know, libertarianizing it. You know, just go out there, find what you can, buddy. CPS will be by if you can't take care of your kids. Right, Have a nice right. Day. Just no, the the invisible hand will take care. <laughs> we'll of take it. care of it, right? I, I really, I'm not sure what's more dystopian. From 2011 to 2015, the number of renter households in suburban areas outgrew urban areas, and yet the number of new apartments constructed in the suburbs lagged behind. Simultaneously, suburban rent prices crept closer to their urban counterparts. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, skipping down, medium home values per square foot up in urban areas compared to only 39% in suburban areas. Right. So um, home values in the suburbs are actually declining, slow, yeah. pre- declining relative to urban areas. Right. But yet rents are comparable. Comparable. Still quite high. Well, they still don't want a certain kind of person and in also the they And also they overspend on their mortgages, right? Yes. So, Both of those things. So the owner of the house. Uh, house has to if charge they're renting more. it has to charge more right right and you know this is relevant to us too. i don't know anything about that what are you talking about <laughs> that we actually could not you know our house in saginaw we could we'd like it. to rent it out there's nobody there who can pay that much in rent to cover our mortgage right to cover the costs never right. never mind heating and all these other oh, yeah. things good god the heating because the rental market hasn't responded with enough housing options for low- and middle-income families relative to the influx of renters since the housing crisis, there are more families competing for limited rentals, mm-hmm. uh, especially for low-income. They talk about the National Low-Income Housing Coalition estimates an average of 35 available units for every 100 low-income households. Well, that's great for the landlord. <sighs> you know that? That's like it's not. It's like really Nirvana not. For the it's really not because even for the landlords, though, they wind up losing money when they have to evict people who can't afford their homes. I suppose, but aren't, aren't doesn't that mean there are like sixty five people lined up to take it though? Well, there are there are ways in which they manage. You know, they keep deposits and all that, right. and so they do profit off of this. Sure, but landlords don't want unstable. Occupancy. Right, they don't want to, they they want stable occupancy. Right, they just want to collect the money, do the maintenance as little as, little L- as, possible, as possible, and yeah. just you're know, not hear anything. Right. So, um, also the same report: eight million extremely low income renters cost burdened. Mm-hmm. That's half their income on rent. Yes, and uh, as urban markets become increasingly more expensive, housing opportunities for low-income renters are pushed further from urban centers into the periphery in the suburbs, increasing the distance between their jobs, local social services, care networks, and transportation. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons we are living where we're living yes. for my, is because I got a job in Ann Arbor. Yep. We looked at a lot of houses in Ann Arbor. Oh, so many houses. And we were looking at buying, not not necessarily renting. renting. But buying, yeah. And we basically gave up on trying to buy a home with inside inside the city limits. Yeah. I mean, I, I was not actually a fan of that idea. But, yeah. yeah. Um, but for, no, ver- for various for reasons. For various reasons. reasons. There, there were many reasons, including like the size of the lot, how close we were to neighbors yeah. and traffic and all that. All those but things. But one reason was cost. Was co- yes, cost was a reason. Was it a, a and not a trivial reason? reason. Just a no, it wasn't reason. trivial, especially given that the, uh, uh, what was the, the RD loan program that we got into, rural development loan, Yeah, would only cover up to a certain oh, amount. Yeah, they, they would cover up to a certain amount. and. But yeah, you know, that was still more than a quarter of a million dollars. Right. It was just yeah. The whole thing was so absurd and kind of, frankly, kind of dystopian. Yeah. Like, well, come here, but you know, it's for rural development. But if you buy this rural property, we won't pay for it because it has like a barn on it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If we we <laughs> they right, to whatever. do rural development, but if we saw a property that we liked that actually was rural, rural. that had a barn and the like. Oh, not like that. That, that was too rural. <laughs> no, we mean like a suburban tract house. What we mean is a suburban tract yeah. house for you to buy. Right. So this is actually a subsidy for suburban developers. It was very strange. Very strange. Say. And yeah, like very you strange. say, dystopian and a lot of Orwellian kind Orwellian of double speak. Double speak. Okay. That. Um, that's how it's going to be? Good. Anyway, Fine. back to back, back to, to the thing. thing. Generally, nearly half of all renter households are cost burdened. Right. Contributing more than one third of their income to housing expenses. Right. Um, unsurprisingly, for the lowest income households, the share of income devoted to rent has steadily increased to nearly 60% of their pay. Oh, Jesus. And you can imagine, I mean, just imagine mm-hmm. your own life that this leaves very little, and not just very little proportionally, but very little ability to weather any kind of unexpected expense. Right. That everything, and we feel this now. That's the thing. And I yeah. earned six figures, right? Right. But 
especially because we were paying two mortgages right, right now. We're really feeling the pain. But, but we are, everything feels fragile. Deeply fragile. And this is one reason I'm just so stressed out day to day, right. is that w- what are the kids going to damage or break, and how much is it going to cost, cost, and how how screwed will we be certainly when we can't pay it right well no and it's and when i say deeply fragile i don't mean like around the edges like maybe if you bump it too hard it cracks right i mean like you bump it too hard and the whole thing just falls crashes apart. to the ground so crashes to the ground yeah, yeah yeah and and also unable to save no completely yeah. unable yeah, to that's, save that's kind of an issue too and yeah. that's makes that's that's the fragility right right no and that's why people get evicted my so parents much. um when there was a problem, like my brothers would frequently knock holes in the wall playing. <sighs> like it was just a norm. And my brother has a story, which, you know, my parents told that they would run through the house and slam open this hole in the wall in the hallway. <sighs> and that was Sunday. And dad called the guy and he came by Monday and he patched the drywall. New drywall. New yeah. drywall. It dries up. And like Thursday. <laughs> They did the exact same thing. So they had like what they could slide in their socks down this hall. Like right, they could like get, do this get a head of steam up and like and chase then each crash other. into the wall. Right, and, right. And they broke well, like they the were wall. turning. Yeah. Like if you lost your, you would like slam into the yeah. wall. No, I remember. You know, I was we we always are yelling at our kids about not playing with doors. Right, don't right? play with the door. And don't, don't, play with the door. And don't fight with a door. Right. Because, but kids do that all the time. They like slam the door on each other, and then the other person pounding, pounding on the, the door. door. And right. I, I remember as a kid, I was only like eleven or ten or something. Yeah. Like you were like a. I wasn't number. some giant bruiser kid, right. but my brothers. I was like chasing him through the house, and he ran in the room, like slammed the door and locked it. Right. And I started pounding on the door, and I actually, I actually put my hand through the door. Through the door. Right. Because it's just this, you know, thing. Flimsy thing. <laughs> Flimsy and thing. And now... Now my mom's got a... Got the expense and has to manage right. that, right? And then, a lot, It's funny how you develop so much more sympathy for, for your, your parents. parents as time goes on. Yeah, so these are... You, we have to say, these are normal things that children do. They yeah. fight, they make messes, they break things. They're just destroying our kitchen cabinets, for example. But. And that's what children do. And the idea that that's actually... That could be the thing that breaks you. You know? Yeah. Well, especially people can't live like especially that. Especially, I'm terrified that they're going to do something to our cars, and oh, that I won't yeah. be able to afford fix the car so I can get to work. Yeah. So, it's a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. And, this and is, but no, and people can't live like that long term. You can't live in this sort of like pins and needles. I hope the kids don't behave like children again today. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and then inevitably they do, and then, or or just are too noisy, and so you're going to get evicted. Get evicted right? because, because you're you too complain. noisy, right. right? And so I don't know. It's just become so inhumane where no one has any margin for error, and, none, and the slightest thing can blow you out of the water, and you know, send you back to starting over at the tender mercies of what living out of your car. Right. You know, good times. You know, good so, times. Anything else you want to say about? About this article, I know you only. I've skimmed it a bit here, but um. Any quotes that jumped out at you? Uh, not yet. No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, we've got a couple minutes though, and I, what what I do think about is the way in which the state has engineered this to be a zero sum game. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that there's no like there's no margin for error. There's and no getting ahead. There's no getting ahead. For for middle class or working class. And it's interesting, you know, most of these people who think of themselves as middle class or working class. Right. Um they're actually wage slaves. They're actually wage slaves, straight up wage slaves. Yeah. And the deal is um everything's at stake. Yes. And you just have to do it right the right. first time and every time. What I kept thinking about, too, is how, like, with communities aggressively regulating, like, mother-in-law apartments and yeah. accessory dwelling laws and right. things like that, they're sending a very clear message that they don't want to increase rental housing no. stocks. We don't want they, this to be They like really this. don't want to. We don't want to solve and this problem. They don't want their neighborhoods to be dis- diverse uh, as far as Well, income. no, that would be weird, you know. And, you know, we don't, we don't want to manage those people. And that makes it 
even harder. And so mm -hmm. a lot, awful lot of this housing stock could in fact be made up by people who are actually poor. Oh, they're house poor. Right, they're house poor. Renting out of renting a out a room, a renting out a room, basement, a renting floor, out a garage, uh, or something, or whatever. Right. Yeah. Hey, time's up. But I actually, there's one other thing that I do, this does bring to mind that I want to bring up here. Okay. Um, because uh, housing insecurity is is a thing for me. Yeah. Um, there's a thing going on in Orange County right now, where there are several hundred homeless people, um, and just like, and they just can't find anywhere to live. Homeless people. Yeah. We're not talking about, and I've talked before in years past about, um, maybe, maybe not on this podcast, how there are people who are, and I want to say maybe 10%, that are embracing homelessness as an alternative lifestyle. And it's a very small percentage, and mm -hmm. you're not going to find them an apartment and a job. Yeah. And yeah. that's not really the goal, nor should it be. There's another 90% of the homeless population who is, uh, you know, they didn't do everything right the first time and every time. Yeah. And something happened and they're out of a home and out of a car or out of a job or out of one of those things. It's not even necessarily have to do with your behavior. Things can just happen right. to you. Things happen just happen to you, right? So it's important to understand that this is not like some moral failing on the part yeah. of the people. Even those, those folks that have chosen this lifestyle, this is not a moral failing on their part. And they've chosen this by their... Uh, they're, they're, they've chosen those circumstances by their poor life choices. Mm -hmm. That's not what's going on. Okay? Mm -hmm. there, so, Orange County, California has a population of about 200, um, I think it's 200 individuals. It may be 200 families, um, which is more people, right? Yeah. yeah. But at least 200 individuals that uh, are homeless, living in tents, being rousted by the police constantly, yeah. living in under, under underpasses and yeah. whatnot. And they keep talking about this problem. We got to do something and have about $90 million to deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. So they have a $90 million budget item in their budget for the year. So there'll be more money next year. For dealing with 200 families. For dealing with 200 families. And I'm like... That seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? It really does. I mean, for $90 million, you could just, I don't know, <laughs> right? You give them all hotel rooms at that, right? So anyway... You, yeah, you could actually could bank the money, put them in hotel rooms, and they could live off the interest. Right. I mean, this is... So, not, you know, something like Something like that. But we, we could do something with $90 million for 200 people. <clears throat> In these in, in these communities or, or are even huge. 200 families. Two hundred families. Yeah, even two hundred families. So in these communities, we're not talking about um, like Saginaw, fifty thousand people. These yeah. are like two hundred thousand people no, communities. But instead, they'll they'll. This well, is you'll probably one tell me what the, one thousandth of the population. Yeah. Not one yeah. percent, but like one tenth of one percent of yeah. the population. And they literally can't figure out anything to do. They're complaining that, oh, are these illegal immigrants? Aren't they? Who are these people? Where are they from? These are your neighbors. I was going to say, they're probably going to try and do some ridiculous thing where they subsidize townhouses, developments, or something. Or some, you know, some profound absurdity. And get people into renting places that they can't afford to rent. They can't to afford rent. to rent, right? I mean, seriously, for that kind of money, they could give them places. But this is whatever, California. Whatever they do, it's going to be a business-friendly, you know, exactly choice. And everyone in Orange County is losing their freaking minds at the idea yeah. that they might put homeless people in houses. <sighs> well, yeah. can't you can't you just move that tent village somewhere else? This is can't why you just you know? I, I really was not in have not been enthused about moving to California. Yeah, and California can bite me. I'm not going to California. Right. I might go to visit. I, I make it out to visit every ten or twenty we have, years. We but, have some friends and relatives. Yeah, but I just I no, I can't do California. I All can't. right. So there's that. Next. Next article. Hey, we're almost done, and then yeah. we can we can go argue with the kids about getting in the car and going to mass. I'm looking forward to that argument. It's, part, it's a highlight of my week. Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, this is an article by Dylan Walsh called The Workplace is Killing People and Nobody Cares. We took this directly out of my file cabinet. <laughs> I, it's a file I have labeled things I've been saying for 20 years that no one listens to. <laughs> no one listens to. Yeah. And now, the title is actually in quotes right? because this is a book review and an yeah. interview with the author. So... The author of the book being reviewed, Jeffrey Pfeffer, not Pfeffer, Pfeffer, P-F-E-F-F-E-R, -F -F -E 
Um, Jeffrey Pfeff- okay, Stop. Too many Stop. damn F's in his name. <laughs> Stop. Uh, the book is called Dying for a Paycheck. Yeah. And I guess it came out March 20th. And I'm going to go look for it, actually, and see if Nick yeah, has, be either us, has it or this could be us, man. can order it. Because I'd like, to, I'd like to review the book. Yes. So this is, we're now reviewing a review of a book. That's kind of meta. And we're having an interview about an interview with an author. Huh. I, if this is too meta, I understand. <laughs> I have to take off my us. reading glasses because the printout is so small. It's so small and I have so to, weird. Hold it, them, hold it, hold it, as try to find some point at which my eyes can focus yeah, on it. Yeah. Anyway, Doing what we can. Doing what so we can. I'll just read a bit. He said, I was struck by the story of Robert Chapman, CEO of Barry Wamiller, standing in front of 1,000 other CEOs and saying, You are the cause of the healthcare crisis. Hmm. That's the lead, right? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it's true. The author then says, um, it's true. He takes three points and, or who's saying this? Uh, it's a little confusing. He takes three points and puts them together. Okay. okay. First point. The first point, consistent with data reported by the World Economic Forum and other sources, is that an enormous percentage of the healthcare cost burden in the developed world, and in particular in the U.S. One moment. Comes from chronic disease comes from chronic disease. Things like diabetes and cardiovascular and circulatory disease. Oh, yeah. A large fraction, some estimates are 75% of the disease burden in the U.S. is from chronic disease. Yes. Second point, tremendous amount of epidemiological literature that suggests that diabetes, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, health-relevant individual behaviors, including overeating, under-exercising, and drug and alcohol abuse come, come from, from stress. stress. And really? third, yeah. how to fit them together. Large amount of data that suggests the biggest source of stress is the workplace. No. So that's how Chapman can stand up and make the statement that CEOs are the cause of the healthcare okay. crisis. Right. You're the source of the stress. Stress causes chronic disease, and chronic disease is the biggest component of our ongoing and enormous healthcare. healthcare costs. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not going to read it all, but yeah. uh, skipping down a bit, he talks about the gig economy, right? Which only makes it worse. Which only makes it worse. It's in economic insecurity, uh, wage growth, stagnant, fewer people covered by employer-sponsored health insurance than in the past, mm -hmm. and strikingly high percentage of people, even those covered by insurance, say that they forego treatment and medication because of cost issues. Because yeah, right. Because cost issues, and you know, we would be some of these people, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So you, the <laughs> yoga classes and nap rooms aren't going to fix this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not. Yeah, that's not the problem. <laughs> that's the tagline here. Yeah, um, yeah. Look out at the workplace, and I see stress, layoffs, longer hours, work, family conflict, enormous amounts of income insecurity. I see a workplace that has become shockingly inhumane right. and then uh he the interviewer uh, talking to the author uh says you reference professor nuria chinchilla seriously his name is chinchilla yeah okay. maybe her name <laughs> keep going okay Stop who describes this as social pollution what does that mean mm. so this person uh puts this in context we're familiar with environmental pollution the environmental right. cost of Doing business, you run your right. business, and as a result, you do a lot of environmental degradation and damage. Right. right. Well, a this lot of social. companies generate social pollution, pollution too, where they damage the social lives of their of their employees on well, the social landscape and well, the social landscape. That people that aren't even employees have to inhabit the work hours that companies are demanding, causing the breakup of marriages, burdens on raising children, general disruption of family life and the family unit is an important source source of social support that's really kind of like the understatement of a lifetime yeah <laughs> right. and you know families they're important they're a source of social oh, really? support <laughs> oh yeah feeding children helps them grow <laughs> you could just let them in the backyard and forage well, but, forage but now you can also yeah. Yeah. you draw this out in the book a focus on corporate sustainability that ignores social damages 
Yeah. And say no one would, the author then says, no one would ever stand up, at least not many people, and say, we clear cut this forest, or we took the top off this mountain for coal, and we're proud. Um, but 3G Capital will proudly stand up and say, we've laid off one fifth of our workforce. Let's pat ourselves on the back. back. Woohoo! That's called increasing profitability. Right. right. And no one seems to wince at the terror. Right. That that caused in how many lives? The point I make several times, there are behaviors with respect to the physical environment that we've decided are impermissible. You're no longer permitted to burn whatever you want and throw it in the air or dump whatever you want into the water. Companies have accepted this and they now parade their environmental bona fides. So look at me. Meanwhile, these companies are engaging in all kinds of things that are harming the human beings who work for them. These are the things they should report on, and these are the things that we should stop tolerating. Why is this normal, though? <laughs> Which is a great question. Yeah. Why, why has it become normalized? Right. I don't think it's become normalized. I don't think it's become normalized. People aren't happy with it. Uh, and people aren't happy with They've never been happy with it. I think, um, I think it's always been this way. We've just had layers of veneer on it. Yeah, yeah. Right? And there's, uh, it talks about, you know, it's always been this the case that people would say, well, why don't you just quit? You know, yeah. If you hate that job, just quit, right? And he ta- I'm interested in the book. He talks about some of the uh, barriers to quitting, mm-hmm. and he mentions one in specifically to changing jobs. Uh, right. One that simple one that we should never overlook is sheer exhaustion. For example, if you're already physically and emotionally exhausted, exhausted because of your job, how are you going to the look idea for one? that you're going to look for another one just you know, having been through this job search process many times, I have to say it's daunting. Yes. And I think part of why I've wound up stuck on unemployment at various times for months mm-hmm. is because it takes me three months to recover sufficiently from my previous job yeah. mm-hmm. before I can give myself a good enough showing to an employer to not look like a in. broken down shell of a man, shell <laughs> of a man, you know, <laughs> weeping, <laughs> like begging for work. You got to work anything. I'll do anything. Uh, and I don't think I'm unique in that regard. Right. Um, our, then there's also uh, there's this peer pressure. So this was a great line. I love this line. Yeah, we're influenced by what we see our peers doing. I've had people say to me, "I look around and my colleagues are all working themselves to death. What makes me think I'm so special that I don't have to?" Yeah, uh, that's like that's the crab bucket right there. Right there. Right yeah. there. Well, no, that was that thing where you ended up driving home, like you came home and you end up trying to drive into work. It's like. Coming down a foot an hour and so oh, right, right, right. There was there was a day a, f- a month ago or so where right. there's literally blizzard conditions. Absolute blizzard conditions. And the both major freeways that I would use to get around Ann Arbor were, were shut down. Were shut down. And I was trying to go by surface streets, and I kept trying different routes. And, and the roads kept shutting and down. The roads kept shutting down. There were crashes everywhere. Emergency vehicles everywhere. And I finally had to give up. I'm like, this is just not, you know, even if it's, I'm not going to get stuck, even if, you know, right. this, even if I'm not going to get killed, it's going to take me three hours to, to drive to work. And then I'm going to have to turn around and come, come back home. home. Right. So this is what's ridiculous. the point? This is ridiculous. But then I felt guilty. Right. Because, well, some of my coworkers made it. Not all, though. Not I wasn't all the only one who didn't make didn't it. Didn't make it in, right. But some of them made it. Like, right. well, why, you know, why do you suck? Well, maybe because you live five minutes away, yeah. right? Yeah. Anyway. Lucky you. <laughs> that that takes us back to the today. previous uh, the previous topic Trick. on why we live where we do. Why we live where we do. Anyway. Um, yes. So I'm interested in this book. It seems like the author is making some pretty bold claims. Bold claims. Some things that, worth, that, need, that are worth talking worth about. Talking He's about. Not, things he, that need saying. It seems non-cowardly and non-butt-kissing. Uh, now, the book may be more cowardly and butt-kissing than this makes it yeah. out to be. I'd like to read it. I'd like, yeah, to, I'd like, like to see to what it. I say. So we're going to try and get our hands on a copy. Mm-hmm. Um, hey, uh, <laughs> what are they called? Stanford Graduates uh, School of Business, but really uh, HarperCollins, Harper Business. Yeah. Hey, send us a copy. That'd be great. We'd take it. Yeah, send us a copy and we'll review it on the show. On the show. For our mini listeners. Yep. 
Okay. There Anything? is profit for you in this. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah. That several people, as many as three or four, four. who wouldn't have heard of the book otherwise, will we'll hear, hear about this it. book exactly. Yeah. It'll be good. Any uh, any final comments before we collapse? No, I think we're there. I think we're there. It's been a sprint. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Until next week. You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Potscast. Check out the show blog at potscast.blogspot.com where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Potscast on Facebook or YouTube. Bing! Okay, so I can never leave well enough alone, and nope. we got through our podcast uh, so efficiently. Yeah. And then, as I was saying, uh, the outro. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. I realized, oh, I I, I remember what a thing that I wanted to do. That thing. That thing that I plan been planning on all week and meant to like write down and. Uh. Uh. Anyway, that thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to remember the start of the Iraq war. Yeah. Because 15 years ago, I was blogging about this. Mm. And yeah. this week, I went back in my blog and was looking at some of the things I wrote last March and reading them and saying, huh, wow. Uh, that guy knew a few things. That guy knew a few things, but also nothing's changed. Nothing's you know? changed. And so... Nothing's changed. In, I don't know, memoriam, I guess, not to commemorate per se, but sort of in memoriam of the... Iraq that was. The Iraq that was and the war in Iraq that should not never have been. I wanted to read some bits of my blogging from 2003. Mm -hmm. And um, these posts were full of links to other news sites and whatnot, especially yeah. alternative news sites. An awful lot of the links are, are dead now, and I'm not going to try and, like, read the links. Okay, fair enough. But uh, I'm going to try and read some of the comments. The comments? Don't ever read the comments. My comments, not oh, the okay. <laughs> comments section. Okay, Wednesday, March 12th, 2003. A2 Daddy... I'm having a bad day, not enough sleep, a cranky son who didn't want to get up to go to school, so you may notice that I'm giving up my pretense of civility today. It seems to me that politeness isn't working. It's time to get cranky. Howard Zinn writes, and this is a link, of the emergence of new voices, unheard before, speaking inappropriately outside their professional boundaries. 1,500 historians have signed an anti-war petition. Businessmen, clergy have put full-page full page ads in newspapers, all refusing to stick to their, quote, profession, unquote, and instead professing that they are human beings first. Hmm. It gives me some hope, something else that will give me hope. Major demonstrations in every city, walkouts, a national strike, anything but business as usual, because this isn't. One thing is making me feel a little better, I'm not alone. George W. Bush is probably having a pretty bad day, too. His own father is warning him against the danger of completely alienating the international community. There's a link to the Times Online story. Bush Sr. said, The Madrid conference would never have happened if the international coalition that fought together in Desert Storm had exceeded the UN mandate and gone on its own into Baghdad after Saddam and his forces. And in 1996, he told the BBC, quote, to occupy Iraq would instantly shatter our coalition, turning the whole Arab world against us and make a broken tyrant into a latter-day Arab hero. Hmm. Link to a counterpunch essay. Will Bush Jr. listen to his father and ease up on the cowboy rhetoric? 
maybe if we gave him a certificate signed by the world's leaders acknowledging that, yes, he's the man with the biggest dick, and the French can't take that away from him, he would breathe a sigh of relief and settle down to the business of running the country. It's hard to remember, thinking back, just how um, how amateur our Bush's presidency seemed. Yeah, yeah. You know, how, like, he he was taking a lot of vacations. He seemed utterly inept yeah. at, at everything. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to say I miss him, but, you know... We're not Actually, it, that that's why that's why forty five just doesn't seem that shocking to me. We can't, yeah, right, exactly. So we're seeing someone who is outdoing even that level of ineptitude. Yeah, it's the same level of ineptitude. He just doesn't have. He doesn't bother to put on any veneer. Right. Right. He wouldn't feel threatened by the existence of French fries and French toast, renamed at the House Office Building cafeterias by Republican lawmakers. You remember that little Freedom Fries, Freedom Toast. <sighs> See the Good CNN times. story, hero. That's See the right, CNN my story. Yeah. My nationalistic heroes. But I'm not very hopeful. According to a Reuters story, the U.S. is already lining up contractors to reconstruct quote health services, ports and airports, and schools and other educational institutions. So they were handing out the contracts well in advance. Well in of, advance. They, they just, yeah. yeah. It's a planned and wanted destruction. And of course, how could these companies, which include a subsidiary of Cheney's former company, Halliburton, get on with the business of earning $900 million for rebuilding unless we get on with the business of demolition? Yeah. They've got just the thing to do the demolition. This, there's a link, this 21,000-pound bomb billed as the mother of all bombs to be employed for, quote, psychological operations. So they're changing hearts and minds by pulverizing them. <laughs> Maybe this will change some minds in Iraq, or at least puree them. <laughs> of course, $900 million could do a lot of good here, uh, repairing schools and educational institutions. Yeah, our infrastructure was falling apart 15 years ago. <sighs> yeah. If you're wondering whether I can possibly be cynical enough to suggest that the U.S. would deliberately spend hundreds of billions of dollars and put Iraqi and American lives at risk in order to provide a few hundred millions of dollars for its favored friends, let me be clear. Yes, I am just that cynical and sick at heart. Now, I would add from the perspective of 15 years later, they also make money on the destruction. Yes, it's coming right. and going. They yeah. make money coming and going. So, I mean, the military contractors get it one way and the reconstruction people get it the it's, other way. It's It really just it's keeps entirely, on giving. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a win-win situation. Yeah. <laughs> Still losing here. Uh, these organizations probably did not even ask for this largesse. According to Reuters, sources at the company said the invitation to bid on this was unusual in that USA did not ask them to set a price for defined services. In other words, they weren't bidding on a thing, but rather asked them to say what they could do for $900 million. Yes, we got $900 million bucks. What do you do? Of course, this is a drop in the bucket, or rather the barrel, compared to the economic factors staring us in the face, yeah. the assurance of continued access to cheap oil. Mm -hmm. Is it so obvious we can't believe it could be that simple? Operation Iraqi Liberation. <laughs> that was the the short-lived name. The short-lived working war. title for the war. And they realized that was just a little too, <laughs> a little on, too the on the nose. nose. <laughs> Is there any limit to our duplicity? The Observer reports a leaked American plan to conduct, quote, aggressive surveillance operation, which involve interception of the home and office telephones and the emails of U.N. delegates in New York, with some links. Halliburton already has the contract to put out the burning oil fields that we set on fire. And there's more forged and planted evidence of Iraq's supposed attempts to acquire nuclear weapons. Mm. What is the goal again exactly? In other words, just what can Saddam do to avoid bombing, invasion, and massive casualties? Fred Kaplan in Slate points out that there are no clear steps Saddam can take. Our American policy doesn't even give him a standard to comply with. Lots of people are spouting off about how Iraq could have avoided all this and gotten out of the sanctions doghouse. But in fact, this was never the plan. The U.S. had no intention of lifting sanctions. Madeleine Albright in 1997 said, We do not agree with the nations who argue that if Iraq complies with its obligations concerning weapons of mass destruction, sanctions will be lifted. 
So we've never, in fact, given Saddam Hussein any real incentive to work hard to comply with UN resolutions. And now we're giving him a serious incentive, the massive buildup to invasion and bombing, to comply, and we've raised the bar. Ari Fleischer said, to avoid war, Saddam must not only disarm totally, but step down from power. What kind of UN resolution mandated that? None that I'm aware of. What kind of precedent does it set for one sovereign nation to demand that the leader of another operating within its own borders and arguably complying, albeit barely, with UN resolutions must step down? Even Tony Blair believes that's not something we can reasonable, reasonably ask. See the Boston Globe's editorial. I'm quoting, Bush's inconsistency on this point, disarmament or regime change? Why not both? Undermine the early case for war. That it reappears now, obliterating Powell's argument of a month ago, is fatal to the moral integrity of the pro-war position. Yeah, as if it had any integrity. <laughs> it's not a surprise that our own allies are ready to veto us. Yeah. Of course, there are some credible threats out there. Iran is apparently close to nuclear capability. Then there's the minor matter of North Korea, I'll just say from the perspective of 15 years plus cachange with whom we're apparently not speaking. Perhaps we could just demand disarmament and regime change all over the goddamn place. Yeah. Of course, we could also consider getting our own house in order. That's one, one plan. Okay. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe we should demand that Great Britain get rid of its nuclear arsenal. Yeah. Unless, and Queen Elizabeth has to step down. <laughs> that would... And unless you do it, we're bringing the mother of all bombs. <laughs> And it's comical to suggest that, right? Yes. Yet this was actually the discourse. This was the public discourse. I'm going to jump ahead a bit. Yeah. This is Tuesday, March 18th. Yeah. Well, it appears that the clock is ticking. President Bush has given Saddam Hussein 48 hours to leave the country. You remember that? He actually mm -hmm. told me I had to leave. I had to stop by the bank this morning and unfortunately caught a glimpse of CNN. The brief glimpse almost burned out my retinas. Yeah. I want to rinse my eyeballs in Bactine or something. Bouncing animated terror alerts ratcheting up to orange. Lions and tigers and bears. Oh, oh my. my. Well, they didn't have Facebook to pick people out. <laughs> no. Yeah, so they had to do it somewhere. It makes me glad that I haven't been following this on television. We don't have cable and we can't tune in anything. Mm -hmm. Regarding my comments previously about hot and cold media, I was talking about TV. Uh, CNN must be the Elmo's world of war coverage. Oh, Elmo's yeah. war. <laughs> Elmo's war. Beep, 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 beep. It would be interesting just how and if the population's support for unilateral military action against Iraq correlates with how we get our news. My hypothesis is that talking heads with earnest, earnest faces together with biased, distorted, and edited coverage and flashy, hypnotic graphics, produce a much more uncritical attitude of support towards American policy. You know, a lot of people, you know, who were supposedly smart people, were like, all about that war. Yeah. I, I still don't understand that. And, like, none of these people have been like, oh, man, you know, I was just wrong. That was wrong. That was just wrong. None of those people, they're all like... Yeah. Well, mistakes, that happened. Mistakes were made. Mistakes were made. War crimes were committed. <laughs> Moving right along. Grace and I sat across from each other at the dining table last night and sighed. However this plays out, whatever happens, it ain't going to be good. There's the retaliatory terrorism scenario. I think it's likely, and to be blunt, we're asking for it. Talk about the terrorists winning. What better evidence that they have already won than seeing the outcome of the process by which the U.S. becomes a rogue state? Yeah and attacks others, bombing and invading a sovereign nation who is literally not threatened or attacked us based on sketchy evidence of possible threat mixed with a heavy dose of religiously tinted ideology. What do you call that again? Terrorism? Terrorism. <laughs> I call it fascism, but carry on. We may not use what we classify as weapons of mass destruction. This has become a new vocabulary word. Uh, now, university universally abbreviated as WMD, but do you think massive aerial bombardments is somehow not massively destructive? 
Yeah. Does anyone remember the televised demos of the fuel air explosives from Gulf War One? I? I do. Designed to rupture the lungs and other organs, burst the eardrums, and actually suffocate and burn the victims. Yeah. That's a conventional weapon. What kind of a sick fuck made that? So is the new Moab, the mother of all bombs. Um, that's supposedly a bunker buster, right? You know, I just want to state for the record that I really resent... Um, <clears throat> having something of that kind of destructive force named after a woman. That's Moab. Re- that's revolting. Okay. That's just revolting. If you want to call it, you know, the, <coughs> some kind of son of a, I don't even know what. But, um, Jesus, you can call it a mother. I suppose we've decided that depleted uranium does not constitute a WMD. But do we feel good about maintaining the moral high ground and not using WMD, but instead massively destructive conventional weapons? Yeah. I hope. I, I, how is depleted uranium not? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you might call it that. I hope President Bush is sleeping well because I'm sure not. Besides the massive casualties, the massive expense, we've got the massive violations of international law. And now, disgustingly, apparently just about every other nation in the world is prepared to look the other way given sufficient bribes and threats when bribes won't work. I actually had links. Yeah. They're yeah. probably dead. The links. The, the links to uh, examples of bribery and threatening behavior to get mm-hmm. other nations to not raise UN resolutions against this. Yeah. We're likely to see environmental damage that makes Gulf War One's flaming oil wells look insignificant by comparison, and we'll have the burden of responsibility for masses of refugees, which we will conveniently blame on Saddam oh, Hussein. Just for the record, um, people in the war zone are experiencing birth defects and cancers at 14 times the rate of people who were, were bombed in Hiroshima. Yeah, this is before, this was written before the invasion, but later mm-hmm. I was writing about the evidence that we were using depleted uranium. Right. But, that, so, yeah, the, um, so we have the evidence now. It's exactly what happened. It's horrifying. We did use depleted uranium. It's, it's totally yeah. horrifying. Perhaps most ominously, we'll have set a brave new precedent and turned into reality the police state, world policeman fantasies of the new U.S. security strategy. Welcome to the future of international relations. Yay. One more th- thing, one thing we can be reasonably sure of, we'll find evidence to justify the war. The U.S. will uncover a secret cache of something nasty. Was it like Geraldo? It was like Geraldo. <laughs> that the inspectors obviously <laughs> overlook, <laughs> illustrating their clear incompetence. See? See? Something that will make the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end. Un- oh my un- unless and until you realize that it's fraudulent planted evidence. The press will be allowed to file in and photograph the evidence, then file out quickly before they notice that we've covered up the Made in USA labels with ones that say Fabrique en France. <laughs> and the French were in collusion. <laughs> or something like oh that. Oh my God. Yeah, no. Uh, did, we, did we even get that much, though? No, not We didn't really. even get that much. No. We didn't even get that much. Bush even joked about it. Do you remember? Oh, no, no WMDs <laughs> here. No w- WMDs here. Ha, ha, ha. Isn't this a funny game I'm playing in front of the, all the TV cameras? So uh, the administration's done this kind of thing before. I had a link, and they'll do it again. Keep an eye out. Watch for that plausible deniability thing. If it's exposed, it'll be blamed on an overzealous, low-ranking official. Right? Yeah. He'll do, like, some time, you know, in, like, a minimum <laughs> security federal place. Probably in Danbury. Yeah. That's a very nice prison, by the way. <laughs> I know the caterer. Yeah. Now, what baffles me is that my conservative friends on Facebook still believe to this day that we found WMDs in Iraq. <laughs> like, they're convinced. <laughs> they can't show me a link or an article or name what we found, but they're convinced that it happened. it happened. Remember, we still have the power to enact regime change here. Let's make it decisive. Let Bush be remembered as the president who was voted out after only one term by the biggest margin in history. (laughs) Yeah, wishful thinking. And pray there's a genuine leader to vote for who can help clean up this mess. (laughs) Stop laughing. (laughs) Fifteen years ago, I was clearly young and idealistic, right? Uh, I hadn't... That happens. Yeah. So... God, we were in our 30s, Paul. (laughs) Was I even 30 yet? At, at least clean up the mess, or at least fail to make it worse. After all, any fool can start a war, and we're seeing proof of that. Well, you're being proof. So then I had a bunch of links. I was, yeah, I was 30. Robin Cook's resignation speech, John Brady Kiesling's resignation speech, 
John H. Brown's resignation speech, mm. a letter by the Australian intelligence officer, Andrew Wilkie. So mm -hmm. I'll have to dig into those links and see if any of them are still live or if I can, can like, find some new. even find what I was talking about. Right. Okay, we're jumping ahead a little more. Yeah, here. a little more. <clears throat> Thursday, March 20th. The rhetoric is flying. The missiles are flying. This is, of course, anticlimactic since no one has seriously doubted that our administration was going to get its war on. Frustrated by our inability to exact concrete revenge on the person of Osama bin Laden, we've apparently completed an amazing act of psychological transference that would make Freud blush. Who was it that was national enemy number one again? Huh. Saddam bin Laden? Osama Hussein? Wait. I'm confused. Wait. And what is our motive exactly, again? In Bush's statements, in Rumsfeld's statements, in Fleischer's conferences, I keep hearing different statements of just what we're doing. Are we there to enact regime change? Are we there to disarm Iraq? Are we there for the liberation of the Iraqi people? Or are we there to bring democracy to the Middle East? All of these things were, were being floated. All right. All right. Perhaps I'm just dense, but it seems to me that these objectives, if not just muddled, may actually be contradictory. <laughs> hmm. Could they? Our cowardly representatives have now felt which way the hot air is blowing and are dropping any pretense of dissatisfaction with the administration's actions. We're told mm -hmm. now is not the time to protest, that we need to come together and support our troops. Yeah. In case it's not blindingly obvious, let me state it clearly. Those opposing the war on moral, religious, political, humanitarian, or other grounds all have the greatest sympathy and concern for those in harm's way. Yeah, now that's here, why we want them not to be in harm's way. <laughs> Now, here's the part that those who mistake metaphor for reality will probably have great difficulty understanding. We believe that the people of Iraq are people just as we are. We do not place the value of American lives above the lives of Iraqis. Mm. I guess this is what really exercises the hawks and gets those opposed to war blamed for treason, mm. providing aid and comfort to the enemy and all mm. kinds of other atrocities. As my wife likes to point out, God is never on the side of the bully. Just never. God always sides with the meek, the inconsequential, the victim, the collaterally damaged. He never takes the sides of those committing atrocities because they were just following orders. To say otherwise is to willfully misunderstand the fundamental messages of the Bible. Insisting that supporting U.S. troops means turning our back on the fate of the rest of the human beings caught up in this madness is a rhetorical act of dehumanization that no principled person could support. Yeah. It seems too obvious to need stating, but let me state it anyway. The way to reduce the danger to the lives of both American troops and soldiers of other nationalities, as well as Iraqis and other persons of other nationalities within Iraq, is to lay down weapons and end hostilities as quickly as possible. Hey, that way everyone would stay safe. That would be cool. As I write this, I can hear the loudest protest march yet outside my office window. That was, I think, at Interconnect. I think so. This gives me hope. I will be joining them later today. This is not the time for those who oppose this war to drop their principles, bend over, and accept the inevitable. If this war was a misguided, opportunistic, divisive, and immoral act before the hostilities got fully underway, and I believe it was, how could it not be now? Yeah. As the weapons go online and the rhetoric is ramped up, keep your vision clear. Remember to carefully separate metaphor from reality and get out there and be heard both now and at election time. Yeah. Okay. What, what else we got here? Well, did you, did you have one from the 25th? I don't have one from the 25th. 21st. I'm getting done with March. Okay. I'm going to just get through March. Okay. <clears throat> so. And then I have a little note about the 25th of March, too. So okay. Yeah. Friday, March 21st, 2003, Drums of Peace, Voices of Sanity. I attended a peace rally in downtown Ann Arbor last night. It's very difficult to estimate the size of the crowd from within the midst of it, but my wife guessed that about 2,000 turned out. 
It was a noisy, but from what I saw, completely benign and non-combative crowd. I saw no incidents or arguments and no clashes with police, although, of course, I could have missed something. There were news helicopters overhead and reporters and camera crews on the street, although without a TV, I didn't get the chance to see how the <laughs> protest was covered. Right. There was a wide range of ages, classes, and nationalities. I saw many friends I haven't seen for a long time. I want to say publicly that I was proud to pound a drum for peace, proud to march with my wife and eight-year-old son, and proud to be one of them. As we start to shock and awe, or at least to terrorize and horrify, it's worth noting that a few of our pusillanimous selected representatives are saying brave and truthful things. See Representative Pete Stark here. Uh, that's the link. I don't remember what it says. Mm -hmm. Most, though, are still dragging out the tired party line that once the troops are on the ground, it's time to abandon protest and throw our full support behind whatever our administration chooses to do with them. It's an Seriously? argument I find strange <laughs> in many ways, a knot of tightly conflated issues. To me, it ignores notions about expression of dissent that this country was allegedly founded on. The Christian notion of separation of the sinner from the sin and a fundamental concern for the welfare of human beings. Representative George Miller said, It's our young people who will be in jeopardy. They are the ones who are on the firing line now that the decision has been made to go to war. They are entitled to our full support. Mm -hmm. But by his argument, in my view, we should reserve our greatest contempt for those who made the decision to put, put them, them in harm's way. way to fight an unjustifiable and illegal war. Does the president support our troops? Gotta ask. I don't think he does. Natasha Walter writes, This pragmatic desire for quick victory, rather than a bloody, drawn-out struggle, doesn't mean that it is necessary to idealize these men who are fighting this unjust war. In fact, it is vital that we do not now start to blur reality by idealizing them. Mm-hmm. Although we should always endeavor to love the sinner and hate the sin, I have little doubt that many are drawn to participate in the military for less than benign reasons. Mm -hmm. There are those in the military who look forward to a chance to inflict violence. Those who have been through the experience, however, are not so quick to recommend it. Even yeah. those just following orders must ultimately justify and reconcile themselves to what they do in wartime. Frequently, the long-term result is a profound disillusionment. And then I've mm -hmm. got some links to some articles that back that up. Mm -hmm. Let us also remember that the, quote, coalition of the willing, unquote, is rather less than one might hope. In fact, it's a fabrication, nearly yeah. entirely spin. Even the New York Times wrote, the administration released a list of 43 nations. It said, were willing to be identified publicly as coalition members. Many of them had little to offer the war effort, yeah, but publicly. moral support. The list included Afghanistan, Eritrea, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, yeah. Rwanda, and Uganda. Um, only Britain and Australia have contributed sizable forces. Yeah. The Marshall Islands. The Marshall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like population 2,000 or hey, something. Hey, listen, you know, they're, they're a sovereign nation. They're, they're not. Well, they're not? Micronesia's not sovereign? Well, is, isn't the Marshall Island a protectorate or something? Oh, the Marshall Islands is a protectorate. Micronesia. Uh, okay. Micronesia, I think, is, is actually sovereign. I don't, okay, well, it's good for them. Bully for them. Hey. Even Canada does not necessarily support our actions. But they're not actually sovereign. And I have a link. Uh, in Mo Montreal, sports fans boo <laughs> the playing of the American National Anthem. Ouch. God bless them. And Dang. apparently the Dow has been increasing for the eighth day running. Well, yeah. Nothing like a war to get the economy moving. Nothing. Okay, so that was the 21st. I'm almost done. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good. I've got one more you piece. you got scrolling to do. I've got some, scrolling, some scrolling, reading this on my phone. Keep those thumbnails <clears throat> scrolling raw hide. Monday or Monday, uh, March twenty fourth, mm. two thousand three. Shock, awe, horror, disgust, business as usual, and deja vu. Mm. It's Monday. It hasn't been a good day in battle, say the headlines. Wall Street has started to lose its enthusiasm, <laughs> realizing to their apparent surprise that you can't conquer a sovereign nation the size of California, even an impoverished, desperate sovereign nation, over a three day weekend. 
So the lucrative rebuilding contracts aren't quite ready to hand out yet. Yeah. Maybe as we listen to the endless echoes that whisper support our troops, we could take a moment to consider how the Bush administration is supporting them by slashing veterans' benefits. Yay! With a link. Yes, they really are pushing this through right now. It's a good time for it, I And guess. the vote has split it's along be a party lot of, lines. There's going to be a lot of veterans. So, yeah. you know, if they're you're planning. Gonna, they're planning, planning for on, it. Just astounding. Yeah. See also this article and this one. In case you missed out, veterans themselves are starting to speak out against the Bush administration. It should not be a surprise that we're starting to see losses. A British jet was brought down somewhat predictably by an American Patriot missile. We've killed a journalist with friendly fire. The Patriots didn't perform flawlessly in Desert Storm and missed a few scuds, including one notable case where a Patriot failed to prevent the death of 28 Americans in an army barracks. See the GAO story on the software problem that supposedly led to the failure here. Link. There's always a few bugs to work out. This should come as no shock unless you believe in Star Wars. Wait, Star Wars isn't real? <laughs> Star Wars, the missile defense system. Oh, oh, okay. That Reagan well, yeah. believed was real, apparently. That's They're, not real. It was a real well, line Skywalker's item. Skywalker's totally real. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Although, you, 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 you saw the last one, right? Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Luke's gotten kind of old and thin. We've now had some personnel losses on the ground. Al Jazeera broadcast footage of American POWs and some killed in battle. I've seen the stills, even though Al Jazeera's website was pretty well hammered. Apparently it runs Microsoft SQL Server, which is relatively easy to crash. They're gruesome. This is not surprising, but the big controversy today. Not, how did this happen? Or even, is this justified by our goals? But should Americans be able to see these pictures? Huh. That was the big question in yeah. the media. Yes, they should. And then, then the outrage. Oh, my goodness. Iraq has violated the Geneva Convention. <gasps> no. In case you missed it, we haven't done such a great job of taking care of our prisoners in the war on terror. Who would do such a thing? According to Rumsfeld, they aren't POWs and so aren't entitled to Geneva Convention treatment. See, the Geneva Conventions really don't apply. <sighs> but the press can't take pictures of their living conditions because that would violate the Geneva Conventions. <laughs> oh, right. That would be wrong. And of course, there's the Iraqi soldiers we plowed under in the trenches or bombed as they retreated. And I linked mm. to an essay, including that famous photo, right? Right. We even claimed that it was legal. And that's just some very recent examples. Please keep these, thing, these things in mind when you hear American officials expressing righteous indignation about Iraq's atrocities towards our POWs. You'd come away thinking that we have some measure of respect for international law. Yeah, we don't. don't we don't. Just to be clear. I quote The Guardian. For the first two days of the Iraq invasion, British and American opinion has been in danger of slipping into a fool's paradise. Buoyed by our sense of technological, political, and moral superiority towards Iraq, and precipitated by our culture's preference for short, sharp, scheduled outcomes, we have risks, risked falling prey to a delusion that modern war is easy, cost-free, and entertaining. Yeah. When it is none of these things. No. Yeah. It really isn't. It's, it's a crime, as it always has been. Did someone forget that in Desert Storm, the Iraqi army was in Kuwait, far from home, with the problem of supply lines, of escape routes? Attacking the Iraqi army in Baghdad has never looked to me like a Desert Storm situation. It has looked to me like a Vietnam, another country the size of California, where it was difficult to distinguish combatants from non-combatants, and where our frustration and fear led us to commit atrocities. Yeah. Meanwhile, on the peace front, the opposition to the misbegotten war is growing and seems to be gaining legitimacy. Mm -hmm. It isn't just students out to cut class who are stating their opposition, and it isn't just about this war. It's also about the new national security strategy, the so-called Bush Doctrine. Mm. This document is what is going to determine our next war, when we've abandoned Iraq to its wreckage and left the cleaning up to various humanitarian organizations that we won't bother to fund. Well, you know. During the first Gulf War, I told to everyone I knew to please, please have their second thoughts first. Mm -hmm. Killing is killing. After the first Gulf War, Bush Sr. crowed that, quote, 
The specter of Vietnam has been buried forever in the desert sands of the Arabian Peninsula. It looks like this time there will be plenty of time for people to carefully consider their views while we dig it up. Yeah. Yeah. One more quick one. What a nightmare. Yeah. March 30th. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to quote everything that's in here, but... um, According to the Sunday Herald, the U.S. is again using depleted uranium weaponry. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna read all this because it's so horrifying. Yeah, no but um, we were violating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Charter of the United Nations, the Genocide Convention, the Convention of Against Torture, the Four Geneva Conventions of 1949, the Conventional Weapons Con- Convention of 1980, the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, which expressly forbid employing poison or poisoned weapons, arms, projectiles, or materials calculated to cause unnecessary suffering. And yeah. then I start talking about birth defects, and I'm not going to read all that, but there it is. So those, that's what I was sharing and blogging about 15 years ago this month in the run-up to the Iraq war and the beginning of the war itself. Right. So I just wanted to bring that up, pull that back out, and talk about it because John Bolton is now apparently National Security Advisor. And I think that they, did they either have moved or were talking about moving the Doomsday Clock closer to midnight? Uh, you know, I don't follow the Doomsday Clock anymore. <sighs> it's too grim, but... Uh, yeah, things are, are nerve-wracking. I want us to have our second thoughts first, for God's sake. Yeah, for God's sake. I want us to go back and remember oh, the please. wars we've protested and fought against and been un- unable to stop uh, in our lifetime. And just maybe not do this. I can, we, can we not do this? I'm very sensitive to radiation. Yeah, just let, let's not do this. Yeah. You, had a, you said you had a, a comment to make. Oh, just to mark the day, um, it's the 38th anniversary of the assassination of um, Oscar Romero, Archbishop Oscar Romero. Today is? Mm-hmm. The 20- 25th of March, Feast of the Annunciation. Okay. He was executed saying Mass. Wow. All right. Another sad thing to remember. And just for all you warm, fuzzy folks out there, that was the Carter administration. Yeah, yeah, the, that... Uh, Great president. All right. Yeah. All right. So this has been a, a depressing little interlude to bring up, but uh, yeah, no, I, I, it's good. It's good. So, all right. I got to wind this up, and now I've got to edit it and um, patch it all together and ship it out. Patch it together, ship it out. I'll be upstairs as soon as I can. So, Sounds good. All right. See everyone later. Later. Hey